at this point in time, I want to uh, introduce a gentleman that I probably met maybe two or three years ago. I'm not sure how long ago it was, JT, and he's he's attended a few of the Oak Pack meetings. During the 2010 election, he called me up and he was asking me for some information about Mary Fallon. And so I sent a bunch of, of uh, information to him about it. And he worked and he contacted uh, Jerry Askins' campaign. He contacted Mary Fallon. He was like a pit bull. He would not let go. He just kept working and working. And he put together a comparison, which I thought was the most fair and the best thing that I had seen. And I actually used part of what you had put together in my Charlie's picks. I thought it was just a absolutely excellent. I've gotten to know him a little bit better since that point in time. And we recently had an opportunity to have a little lunch period for about two and a half hours, one of JT's on the line. <laughs> and uh, I'm just so impressed with him and, and uh, uh, because he's, he's a man that, that loves the Lord. Uh, when the Assemblies of God and the Catholic Church held their, uh, uh, this past summer, and I forget what that was called, but JT was one of the speakers there. It was the first time I actually got to hear him preach, and, and I, I was just, again, so impressed. So we're really privileged to have him here today. And uh, as I mentioned in the email, he has produced this, uh, this DVD called A Pebble in Your Shoe, Why I Am a Republican. I also mentioned the fact that he had recently been asked by some conservatives to go to a conference or a seminar in Norman, which was continuing education for people in the mental health um, industry. And lo and behold, uh, as JT found out, it turned out to be a pep rally for the lay, uh, the uh, GLBT, MZ, P, E, R, whatever it's called today, <laughs> anyway, for that particular community. And uh, so they have changed it up. I used to know what it was, but they've changed it up recently to something else. Please welcome Dr. James Taylor. James. It is a great honor for me to be able to be here, and I will let you know I will not be preaching to you today, so you can relax. Um, uh, we'll, we'll think about that. <laughs> Preacher, we can always, we always can take up money, that's for sure. Um, what I want to talk to you about is this. I, Charlie asked me to talk on two things. One was the conference, and two on the, the DVD, Why I'm a Republican. I'm going to do a commercial real quick, so you can turn the lights back on for a second. I have, there's several items. Uh, take what you want. Um, you can get for 20 bucks on Amazon.com uh, or you can get them here for free. You choose. Uh, now keep in mind, everything costs. If you want to donate something, that would be appreciated because everything that I receive, I put back into this area of ministry. So just be aware of that. Uh, give me a couple of things. The things that I'm talking about today is this. DVD here, A Pebble in Your Shoe, Why I Am a Republican. I'm spending a little bit of time on that. And then also, there's another DVD, it's entitled Safe Sex, The Untold Story. And um, that's up here too. And also, there is, Charlie had mentioned about me preaching an election sermon. This is an excellent, excellent, excellent election sermon. And I'll, while I'm the one who preached it, it's excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, That's confidence, not arrogance. Right, it really is. This is good stuff. You really want to look at this. And then this last one is uh, one that I have, I have, this is a 15 years in the making. It's called The Sign of Jonah. Jesus said a very interesting thing. I, I've always believed that Jesus is the best communicator that has ever been. Uh, that there's no way in the world I could be a better communicator than Jesus Christ. Jesus said something very interesting. He said that... Just like Jonah was in the belly of the sea monsters for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the tomb of the grave for three days and three nights. And so this DVD takes the perspective of, it was probably good Wednesday and not good Friday, based upon the scriptures. And if you know me, you know, if you've ever heard me speak, you'll, and you'll see up here, my stuff is well documented. Because of that, and I'm going to be talking about a couple of things here, there's some other things and pamphlets that are up here. I do a deal. Uh, you can go ahead and turn the lights off now, please, Charlie. 
I do, I speak under the term right, right, which stands for radical, interesting, odd, but timely. And the reason why that's the case is because I always thought it was vain and arrogant for any pastor to name a ministry after themselves. So I didn't want to do that, and so when I'd speak, kids would say, man, that's pretty radical, or, man, that's kind of interesting, I didn't know that, or, man, that's odd, that's strange, or, man, that, I, I really needed that. That was just the right time. So I thought, oh, that'll work. Radical, interesting, odd, but timely. What happened was, I have three pamphlets that you'll see that are up here. I actually have six, but I only brought three. Uh, one is America's Top Ten, at least one of STDs. This is in several clinics. Uh, another one is uh, The Truth is Confirmed. Uh, this is just going back to reconfirming some of the things that I've been saying. And the first one is entitled Safe Sex, The Untold Story, which is coupled with the DVD that we have on it. Now, the DVD on Safe Sex, that's not a high-definition high one. That was filmed in 2002. And so I say that for this reason. I got a phone call um, from Steve Kearns. Many of you know who Steve is. And because I live in Norman, Peter Liberia was going to be speaking, or was going to be going to a conference. And the day that he came in on the 11th of, no of December, when he went to get a rental car, there were no rental cars in Oklahoma. Go figure. <laughs> or in Oklahoma City, I should say. There were no rental cars in Oklahoma City. So Steve called me and said, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you take Peter to the conference that was at the, the uh, Embassy Suites in Norman and then drop him off and then pick him up? I said, sure, I can easily do that. Well, when I called Peter, he was telling me what he was going to be doing. And then he says, uh, uh, I wish there was somebody else who could go. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to go. Uh, but he said, I wish there was somebody else that could go, you know, who could go to some of these other conferences because they have four sessions uh, uh, sessions you can go to at any given pull-up session. So I talked to him a little bit more, and he started saying that there's going to be a conference, a section that deals with HIV education and prevention. That's interesting because that's kind of what my expertise is. Uh, he says, what do you mean? So I began to tell him that my, my pamphlets uh, are listed with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, and I'm considered one of their experts in the subject of AIDS prevention. So I have done, gone into hospitals, uh, high schools, junior highs, all over the country, literally, speaking on this subject. And so that's what I do it under. It's under the name of the right. And so that's, I can get my clicker here. And so I also have, um, this is my book, AIDS, this is my first book, AIDS, There Will Never Be a Cure. And in there I list six medical reasons why there's not going to be a cure. Well, anyway, in the process, as it is. Can you, can you stand back? Just oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I apologize. I'm, right? you, you, that's a nice way of saying lose some weight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm messing with you, And that's my first book. And in there, I list six medical reasons why there's not going to be a cure for this disease. I then said, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And I had to, I think I had to arrange. So I ended up going to the conference and I went to the whole thing with Peter. And many of you know who Peter is. Here's the conference bro program that they had. And it's called the LGBTQ2I Summit. And I had no idea what all that was, but uh, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender questioning, those are questioning their sexuality, two has to do with two spirits dealing with the Native Americans, and I are the intersex, those who are the, the, in tiny, tiny, small amounts that are born with both male and female parts. So I got an education because I wasn't aware of all of the stuff that's going because they changed the name. I used, I do it under GBLT. Now they go, it's, it's changed now, so I, you have to keep up with that. Now here's the agenda. And I want you to notice right here the word agenda, because that's really what it was. It was an agenda. That's what this was. I went to this thing because you get six and a half credits of continuing education for this. This is what our government, you and I, pay for. But yet, who is it that always you know, keep separation church and state? It is the government. But watch what you're going to see. Now, here is the very first speaker they had, Randy Roberts Potts. He is the grandson of Oral Roberts. First thing comes out of his mouth is he starts trashing Sally Kearns. First thing out of his mouth. Yeah, imagine that. In fact, he even made reference to it as um, that she is, uh, she, Sally does nothing but go on a witch hunt and that she's openly hateful. And I'm listening and thinking that somebody's going to say something and nobody said anything. Well, Sally's a friend of mine and, you know, homie don't play that. You know. So when it was over, I thought they were going to have questions. They had question and answers for everybody but him, which I thought was odd. So I went up to him afterwards, waited my turn in line, and I asked him, I said, have you ever talked with Sally Kearns? 
He says, oh, no, I've heard that she, you can never get a hold of her. She's so difficult to get a hold of. Now, I've got her cell phone number in my pocket. And so I said to him, I said, I said, well, Randy, uh, I find it hard to believe because she's a sitting representative for the state of Oklahoma, and she publishes on the, on the web page her email address and her phone number. So it would be easy to do that. And I said, I also speak uh, in public, and I, when I quote someone, I like to go and talk to that individual and find out what they're saying so that I'm actually quoting them at, at, in context. And his response was, well, you know, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, that's what his response was, literally. That was his response. Well, then, as he's talking, uh, I, I make reference to these two comments about being Sally being on a witch hunt and being openly hateful. And I said, your characterization of Sally is completely off base. Uh, Sally is a friend of mine. And I said, I have her cell phone number in my pocket right now. And if you will give me your, cell, your, uh, your business card, I will contact her and see if I can give you her phone number. He says, well, I don't have any business cards with me. Now, oh, come on. thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I gave him what mine. I said, here's mine. And when you get home, can you please contact me so that I can give you the information? Well, I'm still waiting. That was December 12th. Yeah. I'm still waiting because that's not the case. What's going on? Yes, he was paid $5,000 to come in. Now, here's what's interesting. Now, I know something happened because of me talking to him. Because I told him Sally's a friend of mine, and we ended up departing and saying we're going to have to agree to disagree. That's uh, how we left it. Before the conference was over, Sally had received three phone calls apologizing to her. See, Sally is a legislature, and they appropriate monies for the organization that put this on. So isn't that weird? They put this on. Come in and trash one of our representatives, and they were doing the backstroke at this point. And so the word gets out that I don't know if they said I was a plant. I wasn't a plant. I was going there to see what they were going to say. I thought it was really going to be what they advertised it as, but I soon found out that, that it wasn't. The very first walk, uh, session that I went to, this, you can't really see it, but I did, it was a pink, it was on pink paper, and it was entitled up here at the top here. It's entitled, What Does the Bible Say About Homosexuality? Keep in mind, this is a government organization putting this on. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? Then they list scriptures uh, in here, they'll list scriptures here, and then they give a little commentary about how the scripture doesn't really mean what it says. Yeah. Then they list here, you know, where it says here in Romans 1, uh, 26 uh, and 27, uh, the women exchanged a natural function, uh, natural uh, intercourse with for that was unnatural. In the same way, the men uh, gave up the nat natural intercourse for that which is unnatural, uh, and receiving in their own person the due penalty of the error. They go back and they say that that doesn't really mean Paul was writing at a time when they didn't really understand a whole lot about sexuality, and so Paul was speaking about he wasn't speaking about those who actually love one another. He was talking about people who were not being in love at the time, and I'm like, huh? This was the first session that they had there. This is what our dollars went to. Now, the whole thing, as, as Charlie said, it was nothing more than a pep rally. I mean, that's all it was. It was just simply a pep rally for the, uh, the community. Now, I'll put this up here for a reason. This is a box of condoms. Now, this happens to be Trojan brand. Okay. Now, this is important because the last session I went to was entitled... Um, why should we why should we be challenged HIV prevention and education? All right, that's what the that's what it was called prevention and education. So you would think that they would talk about prevention and education. Silly me. As they began to talk, they began to talk about. They asked the question, um, "What do you think would be some preventive measures?" So people began to say some things, and as they began to talk, one of the panelists says, "Well." People talk about abstinence, but abstinence is un unrealistic because people are going to be sexually active anyway. I thought about that. I let them talk a little bit longer, and more people said other things. And finally, I raised my hand. I said, uh, I'm a little confused. Why did you dismiss abstinence so quickly? And they start backstroking. They said, well, we weren't dismissing it. We're saying that we were talking about abstinence only. Well, they never said anything about abstinence only. They just dismiss abstinence. And the only foolproof way to prevent this disease is through abstinence. So they had, they had talked about this, but they didn't mention anything about it and make sure they didn't say anything about it in a way that was positive. So then they go talking a little bit more, and they had a guy who was HIV positive who was diagnosed two and a half years ago. He gets up, and he starts talking about his experience. 
He says when he was diagnosed with HIV, he went on his words, not mine, on a rampage and just started drinking and sleeping with anyone that was around. I'm sitting here shaking my head like, ugh. He's describing criminal behavior. Do you realize that there's a term for that? It's called the Gaten Dugas syndrome. Gaten Dugas was a person who became infected with HIV, became AIDS infected, and he literally went on a quote rampage, and his purpose was to infect as many people as he possibly could. Today you go to jail for that. So I'm sitting there waiting to hear if someone's going to say anything about this and correct it, and nobody said a word. I'm, I was stunned. I was stunned. Then one of the other panelists gets up and he says, well, to be sure that you're going to be safe, you use a condom because condoms are 99% effective. I said, excuse me, what you just said is neither accurate nor true. Even the condom manufacturers don't say that. Because they didn't know what they were talking about. Now, believe me, I've done my homework in this area. In fact, in, in my book, there's a chapter entitled The Reliability of Condoms. And I've talked to the folks that there's a guy in uh, the, the, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, his name is Frank Papyri. He's they call, he knows so much about condoms, they call him Mr. Condom. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate to be called Mr. Condom. <laughs> yeah, and I've talked with, I've talked with Frank Papyri and visited with him and got the information. And so, in, the, in visiting with these guys, I said to them, are you familiar with Dr. Robert Redfield's information from Walter Reed Army Medical Institution? Because his research, and they were not familiar with it, which didn't surprise me. Because Walter Reed, you, oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Robert Redfield used to be an advocate of handing out condoms to people to prevent HIV infection. Key word, used to be. He no longer does that anymore because since that time, he has, in his research, has found that condoms fail 33% of the time in preventing HIV infection. Yet they're telling people, that the, the thing, this was the most insidious part of it for me, is in this meeting, they're telling people that the best way to prevent the disease don't just dismiss it because you know everybody's gonna be sexually active anyway. Now they're telling people that they're describing criminal behavior in the meeting. And then they're giving them false information about the reliability of condoms. And we paid for that. Now we would have never known anything about that because even even uh, uh, Peter would have known about that because he was going to other sessions already. We would have never known about that, and Peter would have never received the information about the what the Bible says about homosexuality. That would have never come about. And this is what you and I have paid for. That's why we need to be aware of that. So that's why, if you get up here, this is this one here, I, I'm going to tell you right now, you want this for your grandchildren, for your children. This is what I used to, used to do on, all the time in schools, junior high, high schools, and colleges, all across the nation. You want this. You want to look at this information, and you want to pass this on, because the idea of safe sex, do you know where the term safe sex came from? That's the t that came from television media to make you feel good about being sexually active. Because the way that our government refers to it is the term with the term risk. It's a matter of what level of risk you're involved in. So it's a matter of being more or less risky with that particular behavior. Now, I'm going to be stop talking about that because some of your, your mouths are dropped down. And, um, if you have any questions before we go into the other part, I'll try to answer quickly some questions you may have while I, um, oh, oh, one other thing I want to show you real quick is, uh, this is some of the stuff that they had, a provider's introduction to substance abuse treatment and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals. This was put on by, oh, uh, well, this was put on by our government down here. Uh, this is by the United States government, uh, Department of Health, and they put this whole thing on, they funded it, you and I, we paid for it, and they, they go to states all over the, the nation, and they do the same thing. And now we met with one of the directors, Sally, uh, Peter, myself, and a few others. We met with one of the directors, and now uh, they've made some changes to how this process happens. But now they have to uh, give them what they're going to be saying ahead of time. Anything that's going to be handed out is going to be passed out or approved beforehand. And I'm thinking, well, why wasn't this done before? I mean, that seems like a very logical thing, especially when you're going to be dealing with a subject of this nature. And so, like I said here, you'll see that I received uh, continuing education of six and a half hours of continuing education of a pep rally. That's what it is. And notice some of the people who this is for. It's for psychologists, social workers, certified prevention specialists, licensed professional counselors, licensed uh, marital and family therapists, case management, licensed alcohol and drug counselors, certified alcohol and drug counselors. That's who this was for. 
They did not get what they paid for. I can tell you that right now. It was not what they paid for. And I will tell you, uh, I, I talked with the director. I gave him one of my DVDs and some of my pamphlets and said, I said, listen, you're going to keep doing these things. Do you have somebody that has a different perspective on there? And I'll be volunteering to do it. But well, I haven't heard from him, so I'm not expecting to hear from him. Okay? So questions that you may have while I make a quick change here. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. No, no, I didn't say anything publicly. No, I did not say anything publicly um, at all on that. That was a real, that was a real disappointing thing for me to say the least. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious when when you uh, when you asked if, if they knew that doc, uh, Dr. Rogers Rogers was the one who was the one that was in the Dr. Robert Redfield. No. Uh huh. Did, did they not respond to you, or was it? They they didn't know of it. They don't they don't know him. They don't, are not familiar with their familiar. Yeah. Well, the reason is is because. If you have an ideology, you're, you're going to, right, your ideology dictates, dictates where you're going to go. Well, same with me. I'm a Christian. And so that's going to dictate to me what I do. It, it, and that's the same thing with them in that community. Uh, he, he he's a pot because yes, it's one of the the daughter's, daughter's oh, child. Yes. Yeah. But he wants to be recognized as Robert Todd. Well, because he still uses it in the uh, in the program. He does that, I think, to to identify with uh, the pot of the uh, Roberts family. I, I think in a negative way, not for a positive. I think it's it serves his purposes to be or Robert's grandson and not just Robert Potts. It doesn't serve his purposes as he would like for that to be. Where does the pots come from? His his what his mother's side of the family who married a pots. Roberta was a pot. Yeah. And his Robert mother was Roberts. Roberts and married a pots. And he was when he was twenty either twenty seven or twenty nine, I don't remember his exact age, that's when he left his wife and three kids and went with his his partner. I, I'm, 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 and I'm, I'm trying not to be disrespectful with the terminology. So I, well, can I, I did being disrespectful is not a good thing regardless. I wouldn't want someone to be disrespectful to me either. Yes, sir. Okay, hey, I'm Jerome. Yes, Jerome. Why is it, uh, since the liberal progressives always claim they want to talk the real truth and tell it like it is and be, you know, intellectually broad-minded and open and tell the total truth, what is it that they're lying so much? Do they know that they're lying? Absolutely. This part of the deception factor. Well, here's the thing. Absolutely, they know that they're lying. The the you know where the best resource of information is that I got all my stuff from? It was from uh, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is a plethora of information, but they don't use it. Well, they don't use it in a positive way. The best libraries are at Planned Parenthood. In fact. Uh, with my book, there are over 500 references in here, in the book, over 500 references. And, the, and even in my pamphlets, you'll see that it's documented. In fact, even in my presentation, in just a moment, you're going to see, you'll see the, the, the slide that'll have the name, maybe even a picture of the person, as well as where the quote came from, and the page numbers all on there. I, my stuff is well documented. In fact, this stuff here, on uh, this one particular here, Safe Sex, The Untold Story, that, that has been scrutinized, that's been through the ringer. And the reason it's been put through the ringer is because those on the other side of the room, they don't like the message that I'm giving because my message is uh, talking about uh, the issue with the issue, like, oh, I didn't talk about that, but I had on the condoms issues, I should have had a, shown you what that, but it talks about storing in a cool, dry temperature between 59 and 86 degrees. Well, people don't realize this, that condoms they're kind of that we get domestically. They only come from one of five locations. South Carolina, Alabama, New York, New Jersey, and Florida. All of those are on the other side of the Mississippi River. Okay? So they're shipped in non-climate control trucks. That's significant. That's very significant. Tracking of condoms were done. There were, well, there's lots of tracking, but there was two trackings that are specific to my conversation here. 
One was done in the winter time, when they arrived at their destination, their warehouse was too full, so they left them outside for 35 days, and the temperature was below zero. They were frozen solid, and they ended up on the shelves. All that's documented in my book. Another one was documented by videotape. The temperature outside was only 100 degrees outside, so it wasn't that hot. But when they arrived at their destination, literally, they lifted up the truck, and they, on videotape, they took out an egg, literally, and began to fry an egg on the metal casing. It was that hot. You know, what's your body temperature? Well, we got a problem if you burn it in your back pocket, aren't you? I mean, I mean, think about it. Think about this. That's, I mean, that's, that, all that stuff is in there because, see, when I, people say, and, and here's the problem I have. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about Christians for a minute. Christians have a tendency to say, I don't want to hear, don't talk about condoms. Don't tell my kids about condoms. But let me tell you something. I talk about condoms, and you want this information. You want this information because you know where I got the information from? From the government. Okay? The government gives you the same information that you need to have ammunition. See, that's what you do. You use their information, and then well, they can't deal with it. My stuff had been so scrutinized. When I, I started, got started, I was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and while I was there, uh, there were people that would bring a tape recorder and they'd pull it, put it up there and try to take my stuff so they can take it to the county health department and try to discredit it. They tried to do that all the time. So I recognized that that's what they were going to do. So I said, listen, if there's anybody here who wants to make a recording of this, just bring your tape recorder up here right up at the front and you get a real good crisp uh, recording. <laughs> I mean, why, why find it? You'll get a good crisp recording. And so what happened is they would take it down, one, one particular was at Pima County, in, uh, the, the, uh, in Arizona, and they said, they said, well, we want you to look at this stuff. This guy's saying that uh, condoms are not reliable, and this guy's saying that uh, AIDS, or that, um, that you can get kids, you, here's some things, you can get AIDS from kissing. Yes, you can. Yes. You, people, you've been lied to, and you can get it. In fact, we have documentation of it. And so they're telling, this, this guy's saying this, and all my stuff has the documentation up on there. And he says, he's saying all this stuff, and the county says, and? What is your problem? Because it's true. And so you'll be able to get that. You really want that one. You really do. That is, that is something that you will look at, and that is something that should be in every high school in America, literally, because that's not what they're getting. They're not getting that. And so, uh, Bob, you want to say something? Let me, uh, let me interject here just a second. If we don't get on with this other thing, then we'll just stay with this subject. That, but we probably ought to get on it. We're going to okay, that's a, what, do you, what do you guys want me to do? Uh, it doesn't matter what me. more questions here? Because if you have more questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I can hold mine. Okay. Okay. Believe it or not, that's possible. Yeah, let's, let's go. <laughs> it is hard to believe, Bob. <laughs> um, the, the presentation, and this is going to be an abbreviated presentation because we're doing two things today, and I will go through this stuff rather rapidly. Um, you ask me why, I do a presentation of Pebble in Your Shoe, the reason why it's called a Pebble in Your Shoe, why I'm a Republican, is because when you get a Pebble in Your Shoe, you can't ignore it. I mean, you got to do something with it, and that's what this is about, it's being a Pebble in Your Shoe, and people to realize that there are some things that are happening in our country that we need to be, be aware of. You ask me why I am, there's, uh, I'm going to skip some of these cartoons that I have here. You ask me why I'm a Republican, I'll tell you why. First and foremost, I am a Christian. Now, please do not misread that. That does not mean that the Republican Party is the Christian Party. Far from it. Okay? That's not what that means. That just means that when it comes to biblical principles, the Republican Party lines up better with biblical principles than the Democrat. I.e., two examples, abortion. The Democrat Party has that as a platform. Okay? Abortion is a big deal. And uh, the, the, at this point, the Republican Party does not have that as part of their platform. The, although there's pressure to put that in. Okay? And I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I work through the Republican Party, but if they start acting a fool, I won't be working with them. I'm just telling you straight up. Because uh, it doesn't make any sense. I have to be true to my biblical values. I'm loyal to Jesus Christ, not to a political party. Big so make sure we understand that. And so the, another issue is same-sex marriage. The Bible is really clear on that. And so those are two issues. In fact, you all recall that they took God out of the Democratic Convention 
And they had a heck of a time trying to get it back in. And even with the votes that they had, you and I both know they didn't really get it in. They pushed it in. Anyway, let's get started. Ben Franklin said this, whoever should introduce into public affairs the principles of Christianity will change the face of the world. He was right. Patrick Henry, who was famous for the statement, give me liberty or give me death, said this, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religions, is not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom to worship here. John Jay, uh, John Adams said this, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this, it connected one indissoluble bond, the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. Our country was founded on biblical principles, period. And we are moving away from that, and I'm telling you, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us. And it's, I mean, we think it's costing us now. <laughs> Listen, the words on the Jefferson Memorial are powerful words. Jefferson says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I think that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Boy, those are powerful words. You ask me why I am a Republican, it's because of this document here, the Constitution of the United States of America. Many people believe that they point to the Constitution as a racist document because of the three-fifths clause that was in included in there. And the problem with that is if you ever read the Constitution, you will discover that it has nothing to do with the worth of an individual, but representation in states because the founding fathers did not want the South to have more representation than they did in the North because they wanted to eliminate slavery. In fact, our founding fathers wanted slavery eliminated within 20 years of founding of the country. That was their goal. But they realized that most of the states in the South actually had more blacks in it than they did whites. So if they were counting them, then they would have had more representation and they would have more say about what happens with slavery. But people didn't understand that. One of the first African Americans, black uh, Americans to look at this was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, he also believed that the Constitution was a racist document. You know why? Because that's what he was told. And then he did something really, really stupid. He read it. And when he read it, here's what he said. The Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Read its preamble. Consider its purposes. Is slavery among the, is it at the gateway or is it in the temple? It is neither. If the Constitution intended to be by its framers and adopters a slaveholding instrument, why neither slavery, slaveholding, or slave can anywhere, anywhere be found in it? Now take the Constitution according to its plain reading, and I defy the presentation of a single pro-slavery clause in it. On the other hand, it will be found, be found to contain principles and purposes entirely hostile to the existence of slavery. Because see, that's what it was. It had nothing to do with slavery. It had, to do with the, it had nothing to do with the worth of an individual. But yet, that's where a lot of people are believing that. You know, I, I remember when we had uh, John McCain as a candidate. Uh, I, I, like, I appreciate John McCain's service to our country. I don't know how in the world he got to be that candidate. But anyway, he was a candidate. And uh, one of the things that I remember, he went on The View. Now, why he would go on The View, I'll never know. But he went on The View, and Whoopi Goldberg asked him this very issue. How can you support a document that treats me as three-fifths of a person? And he was like a deer in the headlights. And I'm like, come on, talk to the girl. And he missed the opportunity because he didn't, well, I don't know if he didn't know history, but that's history. Well, I don't know what the situation was, but that was a missed opportunity that he had. Frederick Douglass was appointed to on positions of, uh, of leadership and advisory to Ulysses, Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford D. Hayes, James A. Garfield. But when Democrat Grover Cleveland got in office, he removed him from that position. And then Benjamin Harris, when he got in office, he put him back in. By 1820, most of the founding fathers had already died, and the Democratic Party had become the, the dominant party in, in America. And they immediately, they immediately began changing the rules and trying to get more slavery into the nation. Here is the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance showed how, how states were to come in to the nation. You couldn't add any more slave states. So what the states did is North Carolina split and Tennessee came a part of that as well. So that's what, the, what they were trying to do uh, is to create more slave states by dividing states, but they weren't adding new territory in the process. The right button here. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was the first time that there was a Declaration of Independence where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that the slavery was being promoted by Congress 
And uh, the Democrats had to ignore the framers' principles on this because uh, J John Adams said this, the first steps of the slaveholders to justify by argument the peculiar institution of slavery is to deny the self-evident truth of the doc Declaration of Independence. He denies that all men are created equal. He denies that he is an able right. In order to continue slavery, that's how you had to do it. The Democrats did pass what's called the Fugitive Slave Law. The Fugitive Slave Law was nothing more, well, it was used a lot to just pick up blacks and declare them to be slaves and take them back, and they, were, they had no process of a trial in the process of that. So that's what happened in 1850. The Nebraska-Kansas Act of 1854 came onto the scene, which was expanding slavery in the states that they were coming out. And you ask me why I'm a Republican, because the Republican Party was founded by the anti-slavery Democrats, the Whigs, the Free Soldiers, and Emancipation for the purpose of fighting slavery and to secure equal rights for American blacks. Now let me just say a little note about this. That's why the Republican Party was founded. It was founded to stop slavery. To give civil rights to blacks is why this party was founded. And that's how it got started. Uh, Anti-slavery Democrat here, Charles Sumner, he was one. You might recall this in your history books where uh, uh, Preston Brooks, who was a Democrat, uh, came across the rotunda of the chamber, and he came in because uh, uh, Charles was preaching for two days on anti-slavery. I mean, he was talking up for two days, and so he, Brooks had enough of it, came over and clubbed him, nearly beat him to death. In fact, it was over three years before he recovered, but he never really fully recovered. But it was over three years till he recovered. Now let me just say a little note about Brooks. Let me just say this. Anytime anybody speaks for two uh, uh, days on any subject, they deserve a beat down. <laughs> so, in 1856, the Republican Party had their first presidential candidate, John C. Fremont. Here is the platform of the Republican Party. It had nine planks. Six of the nine planks dealt with the subject of Freedom for blacks, equal rights, and civil rights for blacks. Now, some of you have seen my presentation. Do you know what the last three dealt with? Marriage was between one man and one woman. Wow. You know why? Because of the Mormon church practice of polygamy. Now, let me, isn't, that, isn't that ironic? See, I think that the Republican Party is needed more today because what we've done... We've got a new form of slavery. We call it entitlement. So now we've got not just blacks in slavery. We've got all kinds of folks in slavery. It is a crime that we've got 49 million Americans on food stamps. <clears throat> that is a sin. I think that the Republican Party, the principles of the Republican Party are needed more today than they ever have been because we've got too many people in slavery. And you know what the dumb thing is? We're walking to slavery. We're volunteering to get into slavery. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. I, I'm, I've got to stop preaching. <laughs> Fremont lost to Buchanan in, in that first election. <clears throat> the Democratic platform was like this, quote, all efforts of the abolitionists are calculated to lead to the most alarming, listen to this, and dangerous consequences, and all such efforts have as inevitable tendency to the diminish the happiness of the people. The Democrats said if we abolish slavery, people won't be happy. <laughs> well, that's pretty what, they, what they're saying now. If we abolish the entitlements, people won't be happy. I mean, it, there's not a whole lot of change in that. The Dred Scott decision of 1857 said this, that a Democratic-controlled uh, Supreme Court declared the blacks were not persons in the Dred Scott decision. They weren't citizens, uh, but instead were property. And here's what they said, quote, therefore had no rights, watch this, which the man, white man had was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. The Supreme Court ruled that slavery was a benefit to black people. The Supreme Court ruled that slavery was a benefit to black people. This is our Supreme Court. Of course, our Supreme Court has some new stuff to deal with now. Over a century and a half, the Democratic Party have often taken the principle that certain lives are dispendable, are expendable, like they did with, with slavery. Today, it's with the issue of abortion. And so because of that, I want to share with you a little bit of the different statistics. There are 12% of Americans who are black. Yet 35% of all abortions are 35% of all abortions are on 
Blacks have 35% of the, those that are aborted who have abortions. In the last decade, for every 100 black live births, there were 53 abortions that happened. This particular ad was forced to take down from New York because it was considered to be a racist ad. Now notice what it said, the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. You know why they said that? Because in New York City, this day, right now, 59.8% of all black babies are aborted. That's 60% of a population. Talk about genocide? Good question. They don't want a solution because of the well, I, well, that's true. Because see, like Jesse Jackson, prior to him running for president, he used to believe what I believe in. But when he started running for president, created a rainbow coalition, that changed everything. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure what, what he got out of it, but I don't know if it was worth it. He's going to have to answer to the same God I'm going to have to answer to. So there's going to be consequences. Here's some statistics. We've had 13 million abortions, and you know what? That is more, since Roe v. Wade, we've had 13 million abortions in the black community. That's more than heart disease, cancer, accidents, violent crime, age combined. Now that figure of 13% increased. It is now 16 million. In America, there are 36 million blacks. We've killed 16 million babies, black babies, since Roe v. Wade. Folks, that's 44% of a population. There's no outrage. Do you realize that Margaret Sanger, what a piece of work she was, was a, yeah, that's a good word to come. She was a racist, she was the founder of Planned Parenthood. The reason why you have Planned Parenthood, most 80% of Planned Parenthood organizations uh, are in minority neighborhoods. There's a reason for that. I guarantee you, Margaret Sanders rolling over in her grave rejoicing that 44% of the black community is killing themselves. Going and paying somebody to kill their babies. The presidential election of 1860 was, was a little difficult. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. The South had two candidates. They had Stephen Douglas from the North and John Breckinridge from the South. The difference between the two was that the Southern Democrats were willing to split the Union over slavery, but the Northern Democrats weren't willing to do that. And so as a result of that, Lincoln won 40% of the popular vote, and he got 59% of the Electoral College, and so Lincoln became the President of the United States of America. You ask me why I am a Republican? Because Lincoln freed the slaves. But I'm going to tell you something. Lincoln was more concerned about preserving the Union, and I understand that, but uh, Frederick Douglass said this about Lincoln in his, because of his, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is what President Lincoln said in his inauguration. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to inter interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Those who nominated and elected me did so with full knowledge that I made this and my and many similar declarations and had never recanted them. Frederick Douglass was not too happy about that. Frederick Douglass said, it is a double-tongued document. Mr. Lincoln opens his address by announcing his complete loyalty to slavery in the slave states. And that's, that's what was happening. Lincoln was kind of forced into it. He wasn't jumping into it wholeheartedly. He was kind of forced into that. Lincoln did free the slaves. That's one of the reasons why I'm a Republican. It's because of this document here, the, pro the, the Emancipation Proclamation that came into existence. In December 31st of 1862, blacks were gathered around timepieces all over the nation waiting for the, the, for the next day because on January 1st, 1863, that's when the freedom began to happen and the blacks began to get their freedom. You ask me why I'm a Republican? Because the Ku Klux Klan was founded by the Democratic Party as an arm of the Democratic Party to regain power in Washington. And yes, you heard me correctly. It was that many people, especially in the black community, the black community thinks that the, Repu the Ku Klux Klan was founded by Republicans. No, it wasn't. E.W. Sweebles, under sworn contest congressional testimony, Sworn congressional testimony. He says this. They, the Klan, Ku Klux Klan, belongs to the Reform Party, that is, to our party, the Democratic Party. He also said this. The Klan terrorized American blacks through murder and public floggings. Relief was granted only if individuals promised not to vote for Republican tickets, and violators of this oath was publishable, published by death. At one point, 100% of blacks 
voted Republican. In fact, Schwebel said that too. Almost, I love the way he put it. The, the, the accents, the colored words there are mine. That's not how they're written. But almost 999 of, the, of every thousand of the decent people of South Carolina belong to the Democratic Party. The Republican Party is composed entirely of the colored people. <laughs> but that's how they talk. That's what they believe. During this time, this is what was going on. Blacks were elected to, uh, to legislative offices, and all of them were Republicans. This is showing you some of the states and the, where they were at. If you look down here, down at the bottom here at Georgia, Georgia had 41 that were elected. Well, what happened was the Georgia leadership said this, well, while blacks might have the right to be elected, they do not have the right to serve in office. And so they set out to try to stop it. And what they did was they did stop it. They came in, they got control of the House, and they rescinded it, and they got uh, 30 of the 41 removed from office, and so their numbers were reduced down to 11. That's what they did. That's what the Democrats uh, did for, for blacks. While the Republicans were in office, they, they did the 13th Amendment in 1865, which was uh, forbidden slavery, the 14th Amendment in 1868, which was born in the United States, you were, you were a citizen. And let me just say this, that amendment, the, the 14th Amendment, had nothing to do with anchor babies. That is not what that was about. But that's how it's being used today uh, in America. The 15th Amendment in 1870 gave blacks the right to vote. Now, in under slavery, the 13th Amendment, all 118 Republicans voted for this amendment. And out of the 82 Democrats, only 19 voted for it. But when it comes down to the 14th Amendment, if you were black, you were born in America, and you were black, you were a citizen, and giving blacks the right to vote, guess what? No Democrats voted for that. See, that's why, that's why when I talk with black audiences, they're stunned. Because everything I've said so far, they, they don't know. Well, you don't know it. Some of you don't know it. They don't, they don't know that information. And yet you can see, I have the references all put up there so you can see where it's coming from. Everything's not documented. Here's what the Democrats felt. Every Democrat must feel honor bound to control the vote. Listen to this. Control the vote. Control the vote of at least one Negro by intimidation, purchase, keeping him away, or as e each individual may determine how he may best accomplish it. We must attend every radical, that's what they call Republicans, every radical Republican meeting that we hear of, whether they meet at night or in the daytime, Democrats must go in, watch this, as large number as they can get together and well armed. <laughs> oh, American history. <laughs> this is one of the ways how they intimidate black votes. Of course he wants to vote for the Democratic Party. You got two pistols to your head. What you gonna do? In Mississippi, there were 444,000 blacks to 383,000 whites. And since the blacks voted overwhelmingly Republican, they had to prevent them from voting. And this is just one example of what they were doing. They had to prevent them from voting. You're, these are some folks that uh, you may not have seen. These are the first, uh, this is uh, the first black senator, and the rest are black representatives that were, they were all Republicans, that were voted in by people in their states to represent them. This one here on the left is Hiram Rose Rebel. He was a senator. He was the only black senator uh, at that time. Uh, awesome man. Awesome man. Because of time, I'm not going to go into a great deal of information about him. And then also here with uh, Josiah, Josiah Walls, uh, he, was, he was prevented twice from, he got elected and they prevented him twice from being in office because he was, he was elected and they, and they changed, they said, well, he, he shouldn't be in there because he's black and they took him out and he got reelected and then they took him out again and then the next time, he was, uh, the Democrats took control and never got to serve any further. Over to your right, I love this guy, Robert Elliott Brown. Robert Elliott Brown is a great guy. This guy was intelligent, he was smart. Uh, he, he, he read in, in uh, Spanish and, and Latin and French as well as English. And so he was a highly intelligent man. You might have seen, he says this, I am a slave of Christian, Christian principles. I call no political party my master. Alexander Stevens, you might recall him, he was a Democrat uh, who was in the House but he was also the Confederate vice president. And so when he, after the war, he was back in the House. You may have seen this picture of the debate that uh, Elliot and uh, uh, Robert, uh, uh, Elliot had with uh, Stevens. And when he did such a good job with his debate that he didn't change any minds of the Democrats. 
But afterwards, the only thing they could say was that, well, he didn't really write the speech. It was so well done and so elegant that someone else must have wrote it for him. You know, it also it kind of reminds me of what Joe Biden says about Barack Obama. He's, he's clean and intelligent. What does he say? I think black people bathe. What's the deal? You know? But, I mean, that kind of reminds me of that. Okay. Now, notice, why did the remarkable progress come to a halt? Blacks were voting 100% lock, stock, and barrel with the, different, with the Republican Party. But something happened, a couple of things, several things happened, that began the process of that change. And I know because of time, we're going to have to go real fast. But here's the first, uh, um, uh, let's see, I don't want to do, uh, let's see here. Um, well, let, I'll, I'll mention this and then we'll move on real quick. The Democrats took over the House in 1876, and here's the method that they were able to do that. They were registering dead people to vote. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> There's tactics aren't being changed. That sounds real familiar. And so the election of 1876 was extremely problematic. The reason why it was problematic was that Tilden was the, the Democratic candidate and Hayes was the Republican candidate. And in the process of the election, Tilden got 184 electoral votes. You needed 185 to win the election. Rutherford B. Hayes got 165. But there were some disputed votes in Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Why can't Florida get this stuff together? <laughs> there, were discount, there were disputes in there because of these, these votes that were left, these 20 votes. They were dual election results. Well, the reason why they were dual election results is because Tilda's campaign had direct bribery. They cheated. Well, because of that, there was a commission that was set up, and they had to decide who was going to be the next president. So in this commission, they came up with uh, that they showed that there was killing and injury and intimidation of American blacks by the Democrats, and the commission voted 8 to 7 that Hayes would be the president. But the problem was that the House ratifies the election results. Now, that's not the problem. That was what normally happens. But they refused to ratify the election because they didn't like it. And so for four months, we didn't have president. Okay? We didn't have president because the House didn't do their job. <laughs> well, well, that depends on who the president is. <laughs> that depends on who the House president is. They didn't do their job. Well, they, he ended up being, what happened was they had to compromise, and the South says, we'll, we'll, the House said, we will ratify him as the president if you will pull out all the troops down from the South. And once they pulled out the troops, Reconstruction was dead and um, it plummeted into a mess at that point. You might recall this from the uh, election of 2010, oh, yeah. where the Black Panthers were intimidating the voters that came through. I want you to notice something. The only difference between the 1800s and the 2000s is the color of the people's skin doing the intimidating. It's still the same party. It's still the Democrat Party. Now, who is it that's always saying the Republicans are intimidating? It's the Democrats. But who is it that we have evidence that they're doing it? What's wrong with this picture? I mean, that's the problem. But anyway, our Eric Holder, our wonderful Attorney General, chose not to in indict these guys for what they did. So they got to do that for free, and intimidation is going on to this day. Uh, this is a great deal, but I don't have time to go to that. I want to go to some other things here. Um, <clears throat> we don't have time for that, too, because of time. I really apologize for being... Uh, late with this, but here's what uh, Ben Tillman, Democrat for South Carolina, said. We said, we made up our minds that the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution were themselves null and void, that the Civil Rights Act of Congress were null and void, that oaths required by such laws were null and void. <laughs> so they decided that they were going to do, they actually were, Democrats were actually campaigning to repeal these amendments at one time. And then again, blacks are unaware of this. They believe that the Democratic Party has always been their friend. Uh, A.W. Terrell from Texas says, the 15th Amendment guaranteeing black voting rights was the political blunder of the century. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt upset the fruit basket when he invited Booker T. Washington to be the first black to die in the White House. Booker T. Washington was an incredible man. Uh, he was uh, in advisory positions with Roosevelt, William Taft, William McKinley, of course, with Woodrow Wilson, a mega, mega racist, gets in the office. He eliminates him from being in a position. He says these wonderful words, I shall allow no man to belittle my soul by making me hate him. And I appreciate those words uh, because he saw an awful lot of things. Uh, this is interesting. The first movie that was ever shown to
to the White House was a Klan recruitment film. It's called The Birth of a Nation. And The Birth of a Nation was start, written by um, Thomas, uh, the, by the Klansman, the, by Thomas Dixon, who was an open racist, and also by Woodrow Wilson's own words, A History of the American People. He wrote that as well. And so that they, they put that together to be the writing of the movie that they made. And it was a recruitment film where the Klan reached their two million member mark, and that was one of the films that was used. It was the first film shown in the White House, was this Klan recruitment film. Uh, you know, you ask me why I am a Republican. It's because the Democrats began lynching black people. And not just blacks, you'll see here, they also lynched whites. It wasn't the, it wasn't the Republicans who started lynching people. But black people believed that it was the Republicans who started lynching. That just simply isn't true. In 1884 to 1964, there were 4,743 people who were lynched. And 3,446 were black, and 1,297 were white. They didn't care. If you were having any kind of sympathy towards black community, then you were lynched as well. <coughs> Frederick Douglass said this after seeing all this ugliness. He says, each colored voter of the state should say in scripture phrase, May my hand forget his cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, Psalms 137, 5 to 6, if ever I raise my voice or give my vote to the nominee of the Democratic Party. He says, God help me if I ever lose my mind, is what he's saying. What was the primary catalyst for the change? Well, I'll tell you, it got started with this man here, Robert Rosa Moton. Most people do not know who Moton is. Uh, most, most people have no clue who he is. Uh, many in the black community do, but not very many in the, in the white community. Moton would, uh, the best way to describe Moton, uh, Moton was to the 20s what Dr. Martin Luther King was to the 60s. And, and in many ways. In fact, Moton was uh, on advisory boards. Uh, he was followed Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington founded Tuskegee Institute. And Moton was the second president of the Tuskegee Institute, and so that's who he followed here to Tuskegee there. He was on the advisory board to Carne with Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller Jr., so he had significant influence. Now, the difference between Moton and, and uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is that Moton would not have had, Moton would not have supported the sit-ins or the marches. That was not his style. His approach was to use the intellect of the mind to convince the white community that there was no difference between blacks and whites. So there was a big difference in their approaches, but they still had the same goal in, in mind. But they approached it in different ways. The flood of 1929 was a significant deal. Uh, the Mississippi River flooded, and it was huge. It caused substantial damage. In fact, at one point, the Mississippi River was wider than 95 miles. I mean, I, I can't even comprehend that. But at one point, it was wider than 95 miles. and and. Hubert, uh, sorry, Herbert Hoover, a Republican, was wanting to become president. And so Coolidge, uh, he, he and Moton worked together, but Coolidge, I think, yeah, Coolidge was a president at the time. He called up Hoover and asked Hoover to step in and come up with a plan to create a method how they could fix this problem. And it would also give Hoover public recognition to where it could be a stepping stone for him being president. And that all that makes sense. Well, these are just some pictures of the flood that damage that was done that you can see how bad it was. You see this picture of the levee towns. That's what they were called, levee towns. And because the levees broke. Well, there were black levee towns and there were white levee towns. And the, the, the way they were treated was very, very different. Well, in this process, Hoover went and visited these things and he wanted to figure out how to get this thing solved. So he came up with Robert Moton and asked Moton to be his helper, helper in this process. They created the Colored Advisory Committee. And, and in this color advisory commission, Moton was the head of this. Now, I want you to notice Moton is a Republican. Notice that? He's a Republican. Herbert Hoover was also a Republican. In the process of this, Hoover says to him, check out what's going on. He comes back and tells him, hey, this is a bad situation. And the only thing that could have hindered Hoover's chances for president was the way blacks were being treated in the levee. Hoover then asked Moton to sit on the report and not give a full report, to give some of the information, but not a full report. And in, in return, Hoover then promised that he would then put the, the old bankrupt plantations, he would divide up and then give them and disperse them to blacks. And that he would put blacks in his administration in a way that had never been precedented before. So Hoover says, okay, that's what we'll do. 
Well, as soon as Hoover got elected, he turned his back on Moton. Well, in the election of 1932, guess what that happened in that? He, he, uh, Moton turned his back on Hoover. And this began the process of blacks leaving the Republican Party. It was started by the Republicans. That's where it got started. But the amount was not a lot. You, they actually, it was only about less than 10% of the folks who actually started migrating away from the party. And so uh, Roosevelt, trying to be slick in there, he decided he tried to get the black votes. So he says, hey, why don't you blacks come join the Democratic Party? And, and the, the, the Republicans put this uh, handbill out that says, who's a Democrat? And it shows down here in the bottom the lynching that happened in Florida of the Smoke Brothers, the two Smoke Brothers who'd been lynched, and that pretty much settled the idea of blacks jumping uh, full stream into that, the, the Democratic Party. Roosevelt created the Black Cabinet. He was the first Democrat to place language in a platform calling on an end to racial discrimination, but he also knew that his party leaders would not allow anything to happen with that, so it was really just more uh, in words only. And I'm going to flip through this stuff here real quick. When, uh, this was uh, George Wallace when he was running for governor of Alabama. The Klan was very much connected with this group. And, and when he was running the first time, he re refused to accept the Klan's endorsement, and he lost. And the next time, he took their endorsement, and he won the election. Uh, this was a march that was done to Washington State, uh, Washington, D.C. Many of the people in the Senate and the House, they just really went to their closets, grabbed their robes, and just stepped into the line. That's how prevalent it was. I mean, it, that was a common thing. Uh, I'm going to move forward to this with some things here. Um, Eisenhower, in 1957, he proposed a bold civil rights bill to increase black voting rights and their protection. And in the process, they were met with, he was met with filibustering by uh, James Eastlet and by Senator Strom Thurmond at the time. And they prevented a lot of this stuff from happening. Again, they both were Democrats. The Democrats are starting to continue to prevent things from happening. But they did get a civil rights division out of the Justice Department and a civil rights commission, which later came into play when the civil rights bills came into play. In 59, he presented another bill trying to get more civil rights, and uh, Democrat Howard Smith from Virginia, from the chairman of the House and Rules Committee, he blocked every way possible this process. And in the process of this, uh, he would go away for two to three weeks at a time so that the committee would not meet to have to vote on things. Can anybody say Wisconsin? I mean, I'm telling you, Democrats don't change tactics. They don't change. Why should they? They keep working because we sit back and say, wow, what are they doing? Why doesn't somebody do something? And that's what I can't understand. Why we just keep sending people there that keep doing the same stupid thing and not addressing these issues and these concerns. I know that this, this time, with the last eight years, nobody really wanted to say anything to Barack Obama because in the Republican Party they were afraid that they had to be called a racist. Well, there's a lot to talk about Barack Obama that has nothing to do with race. But we didn't hear any of it. We didn't hear any of it. And, and so, uh, don't get me started, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a picture of the Wisconsin February 11th when they did the same thing. John F. Kennedy uh, was, <laughs> he came kicking and screaming into the civil rights movement. It was not something that he really wanted to do, but he came kicking and screaming. But he gets, all the, he gets a lot of credit for this, but that's, uh, he, that was not his real main deal. Because uh, under him, they, remember they were doing these water cannons and, uh, uh, in, in, in the South, uh, the dogs that were attacking the folks. And he was doing everything he could until his assassination. When the governor started doing this stuff in there and they had to bring troops down, that's when he started doing emphasis on the civil rights. And so, uh, but he never got to see the fruition of his work. It, it got passed on to his predecessor. Oh, what a piece of work. Woo! Uh, this man has done, done tremendous damage to the Constitution and to America. We don't have time to talk about that, but uh, Johnson became his follower as a president. Uh, Johnson started seeing the civil rights movement as an opportunity. He, he, he didn't care about blacks. He just saw it as an opportunity to get brownie points and to maybe be able to steal votes from the party of Lincoln. And so the bills that he presented were blocked by Robert Byrd and Russell, uh, Richard Russell of Georgia. We could also add Al Gore's daddy, who was a senator who was fighting it as well. I mean, we could go through a whole list of all these wonderful people who, are, who were, were fighting these bills. But they came back, and Everett, uh, Everett Dickerson, Republican, he got it passed, and he fought these guys. And so we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that came as a result of this. 
Martin Luther King is the most probably the most recognized name during this time period. But here's the thing, Martin Luther King was like Frederick Douglass. He too was a preacher of the gospel. And Martin Luther King uh, was with Johnson when he signed the Civil Rights Bill. But I want you to notice something. Dr. Martin Luther King was a Republican. In fact, so was Do uh, Dr. Abernathy. He was a Republican. Most of the civil rights leaders at that time were Republicans. They didn't have a choice in the matter. Yet, that's not where they, you hear, you think that they were all Democrats, but that just simply wasn't the case. The Democrats had it within their power to pass the civil rights resi resi uh, resignation, or resolutions, but they didn't. In fact, they had 315 Democrats in the House. I mean, they had two-thirds of the Senate. I mean, they, they, they could pass anything that they wanted, because the, the Republicans couldn't do a thing about it. They needed only 269 votes, and they got 198 votes. It was because of the Republicans that these bills got passed, because the Democrats, they wanted to keep blacks in slavery, keep them in being in bondage. One of the other things that happened, uh, well, this talks about that uh, the Civil Rights, let me go back here, this, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 gave civil rights for all people. Well, the person who was stopping civil rights, it was the Democrats. Now, I didn't go into this, but the Voting Rights Act banned literacy tests. That was what the Democrats put in. All the Jim Crow laws, the Democrats put that in. That wasn't done by the Republicans, and that's all in the DVD. You can watch that on your own. And then the 24th Amendment of 64 abolished the poll tax. Well, who put the poll tax in? Again, it was the Democrats who did that. Uh, Rainey here, he, was, he said, we intend to continue to vote so long as the government gives us the right and necessary protection. I know that right accorded us now will never be withheld in the future if left to the Republican Party. Thurgood Marshall was appointed as a first black chief justice by Lyndon Johnson. And uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, said this to one young staffer, son, when I appoint an N-word to the court, I want everybody to know he's an N-word. That's how he loved, that's how much he loved black folks. Now, I can tell you a lot of stuff tonight, but no time for that. Uh, this was a rumor that was started. I don't know who started the rumor, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't the Republican. They started this rumor, and this was one of the big things that got a lot of blacks to switch over to the Democratic Party. If Republicans were elected to Congress or the presidency, they would not extend the 1965 Voting Rights Act and would, in fact, remove the right to vote from African Americans. Well, the, 13th, uh, the 14th, 15th Amendment gave blacks the right to vote. Okay? So that, that had nothing to do with it. And there were certain aspects of the Voting Rights Act that had to be, had to be reviewed periodically. And in fact, I think it was the 101th Congress, they wanted to make the Voting Rights Act issues permanent, but the Black Caucus refused to do it because it was a tool that they could use in their campaign. Who said this? Uh, we don't know. It's just a rumor that began happening. Now, I think it was the Democrats. Why would the Republicans say this? I mean, why would the Republicans say that? I mean, they wouldn't. Frederick Douglass said this, for colored voters, the Republican Party is a ship, all else is the sea. You ask me why I'm a Republican, because these two guys are Democrats. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>